growth remaining. And I, I know when Farooq first gave me this topic, I was really tearing whatever little hair I had remaining to think, how could I make this talk a little more interesting for everyone? And when we actually look at growth, any of us who deal with kids cannot help but feeling enthralled at seeing the kids dwell up from tiny little babies when we first see them to these young adults, really beautiful as they grow through adolescence. So the question here that I had to address in this talk is, why is this important? Why is growth remaining the concept so important to us? We know that the prediction of growth remaining is an integral component to evaluate and manage any limb length inequality and a deformity. And we have two common scenarios. Either you have a child who has a limb length inequality or you have a child who has, who has a deformity. In a child who has a limb length discrepancy, the question we're trying to answer is, how can we predict the severity of the discrepancy at skeletal maturity? Because that's what's important to us. How do we choose between limb lengthening, which is a complex method, versus just giving a prosthesis? And if we are planning to uh, uh, level the limb lengths out of skeletal maturity, when do we time the epiphysiodesis? Similarly, when we're dealing with a child who has a complex deformity, we're looking to see what is the risk of progression to choose whether growth modulation would work in this child, because that's the in thing now since the last 10 years, or would we have to resort to an osteotomy? And if we're doing a growth modulation, when to time the growth modulation is what's absolutely important. So clinical scenarios are like this. You have a child with a posterior bowing of the tibia. We know that the main problem in these children is at skeletal maturity, they have a limb length discrepancy. The angulation almost entirely corrects itself out. When do we time limb lengthening or when do we time epiphysiodesis of the contralateral limb is the crucial point to answer in the first case. The one below has a tibial hemimelia. And again, the same question arises that when you have such a complex deformity, are we going to reconstruct, which requires a, a whole deal of skill, or are we going to give a, this child an extension prosthesis? And similarly, when we have a child with a proximal femoral def deficiency, when you have very severe shortening, it requires a great deal of skill to understand should we reconstruct or should we make things simpler for the child and give the child a prosthesis. In the, in the, in the scope of clinical applications of deformity, a frequent scenario where you have a child like this who has a genovarum secondary to heel rickets, the intercondylar distance is four inches. Will this correct with growth? What's the prognosis of this deformity? And if we know the natural history, as uh, Farooq has shown us, we know that growth is a great leveler. And with time, if we leave this alone and observe it, we know that this child will remodel itself completely. So to answer this question of growth calculation, how do we predict? For the first time, we're called upon as orthopedic surgeons to do something which we're not familiar with, to be almost like an astrologer to predict to that family what is the chance of this child requiring a complex procedure and at what time in that child's life so that they can prepare themselves mentally, financially, for, and emotionally for this concept of what we want to do for this child. So there are three or four methods that have been used very well in literature, starting with the simple arithmetic method, going on to the more complex method, and I'll run through each of them with you very quickly. The arithmetic method is the simple one used by White and Menelos. It's a simple um, uh, calculation based on the chronological age. And because it's simple, it is the one which is the most inaccurate. And we know that less than 50% of children have a chronological age which is in harmony with their skeletal age. So we know that, really speaking, when it comes to children, when we talk of growth and maturity and uh, puberty, Chronological age has the least importance to us. It is what the skeletal age, what the bone age of the child is. Still, knowing this concepts are important because some really fascinating facts come out by knowing the growth of children. If you look at this chart, you'll realize that the proximal femur grows at a rate of roughly three millimeters per year and contributes just about 15% to the total limb length of the lower limb. The distal femur is the big daddy, nine millimeters per year, and we know that this growth plate is the most important for giving us limb length. And any damage to this growth plate by trauma or infection can land you off with a very severe limb length discrepancy as skeletal maturity. It contributes almost 33%, uh, 37%, or one third of the length of the lower limb. The proximal tibia is next, and a very nice fascinating ratio to understand is that the proximal tibia almost always grows at 75 to 80% of, of the distal femur. That ratio throughout life, whatever the age of the child is or whatever length of the bone is, the proximal tibia is always 75 to 80% of the growth of the distal femur. And the distal tibia contributes about 20%. Another important thing that if you use chronological age, which is again inaccurate, we know that roughly, though we talk of the year age of 18 as being a child becoming an adult, 
we know that from the skeletal point of view, by the age of 14 or 15, almost all growth has ceased in a girl, and by the age of 16 or 17, entirely growth has ceased in a boy. Another good rule of thumb is that if you're looking to correct some degrees of limb length discrepancy, we realize that if you have a child who's attained puberty, we still have around five centimeters of growth to play around with at the knee. It's a very nice rule of thumb. So if we're dealing with a discrepancy which is in the range of around five centimeters or, or so, by puberty, you have that five centimeters to play around with. If you look at growth in its entirety, you realize that it has these four phases. The first one is what we call the antenatal phase, and this is the most, we, we, uh, we disregard this entirely because we just don't know what is happening in utero, but the gynecologist knows that the tiny little mustard seed, which is one millimeter at the age of, at four weeks, when the mother just realizes that she's pregnant, becomes a one and a half foot child at birth. So that's huge exponential growth that's occurring in utero. The first five years of life are the most rapid. And then over five years to puberty, which is an eight-year duration approximately, the growth is fairly stable. And then again, you hit the period of puberty when you have exponential growth of around three-fourths of a foot in a span of one to one and a half, half years. So if you look at the growth chart of boys, you'll realize that this is, again, extremely fascinating, that you'll see that what I've talked about, that the first five years of life are where you have this very rapid growth. And then for the next eight years, you plateau out, and then you hit that growth spot at puberty and put on about uh, several inches in that span of a year or year and a half. The first person who actually started looking at this in great detail and tried to predict growth and deformity were these two researchers from Boston. And this is the chart that we use all the time, and this is the Green and Anderson charts. Interestingly, for the last 65, uh, 50 years, we've been using these charts. They are based on just 100 children, 50 boys and 50 girls who are entirely the white population, who were from a very urban center in Boston. 50% of them had poliomyelitis. And I'm sure if this data was presented, it would not stand muster for publication in even the worst online journal that we have today. But this is the granddaddy of all growth charts. And you must understand that the seminal work done by them really showed for the first time how children grow longitudinally where they studied them over the eight years of their growing uh, phase of life. And then they came out with these growth charts. And the few things that came out from these growth charts is one, that they understood for the first time that we should be using skeletal age based on the Grulich and Pyle charts and not on the chronological age. They estimate the growth potential in the two big bones which grow, physis, which grows the fastest, the distal femur and the proximal tibia. And they understood that we must have separate charts for boys and girls. So 50 years back, that was huge work which was presented in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery. And that's a reference for those of you who are interested, um, JBGS 1963. And interestingly, over the last 50 years, every other modification of predicting growth has been based on the template provided by Green and Anderson. Then came a very smart man from California, and Colin Mosley was, to a very large extent, a mathematician more than um, a physician. And he looked at that data of Green and Anderson and said, you know, hey boy, why look at these curves? Why look at these growth, the growth curves which are complex to understand? Let's take all that data, the same data that Green Anderson had, and let's plot it on a graph. And to his amazement, he did that, those bell-shaped curves became a straight line. And he showed that if you use a straight line graph, you can predict more accurately what Green and Anderson were trying to do from their growth curves. And for you, who are, those of you who are interested, it's a very nice, detailed analysis of how this is done. This is the one which is most commonly used in the United States, uh, at least when I was doing my fellowship, where we would painstakingly, at three intervals, measure three important parameters every time the child came to us with a limb length discrepancy or a deformity. One is measure the length of the long leg. The second is to measure the length of the short leg. Third is to plot the skeletal age. And for each of these, uh, at each time, you do one, two, and three. So three measurements. And then you do them again every four months or so. And you get this line. And you know the normal limb is growing that way. And you know the trend of the abnormal limb. And the distance between the two at skeletal maturity is the predicted limb and discrepancy. So a very, very um, analytical method of understanding what is going to happen and predict growth at skeletal maturity. Then, of course, another smart individual, Frederick Shapiro, came out to, to, to tell us that all this looks very fancy and very nice, but growth just doesn't happen that way. 
there are different patterns of growth inhibitions, and every child with a discrepancy doesn't just follow these beautiful straight line graphs. Because you have different patterns, it's only the congenital ones who have a straight line and an upward slope. But several of the neuromuscular, developmental, congenital hypertrophies will have different patterns. They could have an upward slope and then plateau. They could have an upward slope and then actually decelerate. They could have an upward slope, plateau, and again go up. Or they could have a, a acceleration and a rapid deceleration. So depending on these five different growth patterns, he's the one who made us understand that growth prediction is not all that simple. It took another 25 years for another very smart man to come on the scene and who looked at the same data of Green Anderson and said, okay, Colin mostly made a straight line. That data is actually telling us something in, in arithmetic. And he found out, just looking at that, that voila moment where he says, Eureka, all these growth charts, the bar graph, the line, all can come down to basic numbers. And that number is basically a multiplier. So if you find for a particular age, what is a multiplier? We could just use simple arithmetics, avoid using any plotting on graphs, which we are very, extremely bad at, and just use a multiplier to find out what is the predicted discrepancy as character maturity. And this is absolutely fascinating. If you look at birth, the lower limb has reached 20% of its final length. And therefore, the multiplier at that age for a limb discrepancy is 100 by 20, which is a factor of 5. By the age of 1, you have already achieved one-third the length of what your adult femur is going to look like. And the multiplier is 100 by 33, which is a multiplier of 3. At age of 4, you have attained 50% of your adult length, and your multiplier becomes 2. Similarly, at, length, at age 7, you have achieved two-thirds of your adult femur length, and your multiplier is 1.5. And at the onset of puberty, you still have that little push of growth left, and your multiplier is 1.1. So these are the landmark ages to remember, the age of 1, the age at uh, four, seven, and prepubertal. What does that mean for us? In simple terms, if you have a child who comes to you with a limb discrepancy of three centimeters at birth, at maturity, you multiply that by five, his, mature, his discrepancy is going to be 15 centimeters. Whereas if you have a child who comes at seven with the same discrepancy of three centimeters, at maturity, you multiply that by a factor of 1.5 and his anticipated uh, uh, discrepancy at skeletal maturity will be 4.5. So all this works extremely well as long as you understand Shapiro's work, that this is for congenital problems which follow a steady upward slope. These simple multipliers will not work so easily when you have other conditions which don't follow this lovely pattern. To make things simpler for us, there's a multiplier app. Has anyone aware of this? Has anyone used the multiplier app? Yeah. So now on iOS as well as on Google, this is work done again from Paley's, Paley's uh, work, published from Baltimore. And it's now so simple that rather than understanding all these complex algorithms which go into it and these complex equations, you can simply use the charts and use the data, enter the, the, the points that you have to, and that smart computer does everything out for you and works it out what is the estimated. So if you have that example as I've shown you, a one-year-old child who's a male, you find that he has, you can find out what his uh, discrepancy is, and then at skeletal maturity, what's it likely to happen. Similarly, if you have a congenital discrepancy, you use a different um, uh, formula, and you can see that that's what we have done here. You can predict at maturity that this child who has a one-inch discrepancy at uh, birth will have a three-inch discrepancy at skeletal maturity. And you can even show for different ages, and you can show that app to, your, to the parents and say, you know, when the child is five, this is what his feet are going to look, this is what his limbs are going to look like. And when he's skeletally mature, this is what his final discrepancy. That's a huge amount of information for parents who need to plan. When it comes to developmental dif uh, the, uh, discrepancies, Paley gave us this very simple formula. I'm sure all of us can crack this. So that's the formula that's required. So you require delta plus i into g, and then i is whatever, all that stuff. I just don't break my brains. I just feed it into the app, and you get your answer right away. So all this is arithmetical, all this is uh, logarithmic. The app works it out all for you. You don't have to apply these complex formulas which brainy people have uh, devised. So therefore, finally, to understand that all predictions of growth have an inherent error of at least 12 months. They give an accuracy of 1.5 centimeters. So however advanced your technology is, 
growth is so variable that at the best, these are the figures that you will get. Remember that you should not take a single measurement and make a prediction. You need at least three measurements, ideally every four months, to get your uh, values as good as possible. And I remember De Meglio's statement, which is a very powerful one, that one measurement is usually an error, two measurements give a trend, and three measurements allow a curve to be drawn. So unless you have those three measurements serially, you should not be predicting growth at skeletal maturity. Turning track a little bit further now, coming to deformities, how does this implicate planning for a deformity? And ever since growth modulation has had this big surge over the last 20 years with the work done by Peter Stevens with the development of the eight plate, we have started asking more and more questions to try and understand how growth implicates a deformity progression. We know how powerful it is. This is a six-year-old girl whom we operated almost seven years back and she had an intercondylar distance of 30 centimeters, and you can see with simple growth modulation, this girl at five years down the line is completely corrected. So this is an extremely powerful technique, and when we have the power, we need to understand what are the destructive elements of that power. So we now have a 12-year-old girl. She has bilateral post rickettic uh, genu valgum of 15 degrees, and the question I need to ask myself now, this girl is going to hit skeletal maturity very soon. She might develop uh, puberty and menarche in the next six months. Will growth modulation work in this child? And when we apply the growth place, we found that it does. But that doesn't help me. Did I, could I predict it? Could I tell the parents that there's a reliable chance that growth modulation in this pre-pubertal girl is going to work or not? Similarly, we now have this 12-year-old boy who's got a huge genu valgum of, of 35 degrees. Will growth modulation be powerful enough in this pre-adolescent boy to give me the correction because if I don't know that, you're going to have unhappy parents who say that you promised us the stars and you didn't deliver. So we understand that growth modulation, besides being a very simple method, is dependent on two very important things. The severity of the deformity when the child first comes to you that requires that correction, and what is the number of years of growth remaining to correct that deformity. So these two factors guide success and failure of growth modulation. Very nice work come from UK tells us that the rate of correction is easy to understand. Roughly speaking, the femur gives you around 0.7 degrees per month, the tibia around 0.5 degrees per month, and if you combine both of them, you can get almost 12 to 14 degrees of correction in a year. So this is helpful information. So we know what is the potential of each physis to contribute towards deformity correction. But the next important thing to understand is what is the skeletal age of that child? How do I know that we have those years of growth remaining because we know that chronological age is not going to help us at all? So is there a way to determine the skeletal age and to predict with a degree of sureness what is the onset of puberty? And you have various methods to predict, to predict skeletal age. The one that was used most commonly was the Grulik and Pyle charts. Now again, this is data based on urban white kids. And for several years, it has been used. And we know from the Rulik and Pyle charts that they are fairly inaccurate, especially around the age of puberty, because the changes that occur in the carpal bones are the maximum in the younger child. But as you reach puberty, in that two years that you want to predict when puberty will occur, the changes in the hand and the carpus are not that much. So that doesn't really help us. The RISA index is very popular among spine surgeons, and we really know for the lower limb, it is useless. Because by the time you hit RISA 1, you're already skeletally mature. So having a RISA 1 doesn't tell me anything because beyond that, there is no growth left. So RISA 1 to RISA 4 makes no difference to me because I know that there's no limb length left because at RISA 1, the girl has attained menarche already. People have used the calcaneal apophysis, and that's recent uh, information, again, which is useful because we want to know when is that peak height velocity, or the PHV, when is the time that we have maximum growth before puberty hits and stops growth? And using the calcium apophysis, you know that if you look at the stage three and four, this is the time when you have the peak height velocity. So if you have crossed that, and if the apophysis completely caps the calcaneum, there's almost no growth left. So taking an X-ray of the heel, the lateral view, using the calcium apophysis helps us to understand growth remaining. But I think the most important, the, the most useful is a soft brand method of the elbow apophysis. And this is a study which was actually done almost 50 years ago. It didn't get very popular because a lot of it was published initially in French literature. 
But what he does is to use the elbow apophysis, sorry, the elbow growth centers to predict when is the style going to become skeletally mature. And especially if you look at the olecranon, you'll find that it goes through five or six different stages which are fairly reliable to tell us. And if you plot it on the growth chart of a child in that prepubertal age, the peak is when we want to know from 11 to 15. If you look at this triangle, this is where you have menarche, which is puberty, which is RISA-1. But all the growth that is happening, that exponential peak height velocity is before puberty. So we want to catch that. Once the child or the girl has attained menarche, the growth in the lower limbs is minimum. So we want to catch that on the upswing, on the uprise of that graph to know whether growth modulation will work or not. And if you look at once the electron apophysis is fused, there is no further growth left. So that's a very good surrogate to realize that if you take a child who's 12 and you have girls who attain menarche at 12 and you have a girl sometimes who attains menarche at 10, if you take an elbow x-ray and you find that the electron apophysis is fused, there's no further growth left. So growth modulation is not going to work. You don't have to waste your time, and you can tell the child that this child needs an osteotomy. So therefore, in this 12-year-old, her genovalgum, with an intermalleal distance of 6 inches, which is pretty much, she's got a femoral angle of around 12 degrees on one side and 20 degrees on the other side. Do I have enough growth left to correct this deformity? Going by the work from Nyagam, which tells us that the femur and tibia together will give you around 10 to 15 degrees of correction per year, which means I need at least two years of growth remaining to get correction with my growth modulation. We take an elbow x-ray, we find that the electron apophysis in, is in stage two, which means that the stage one is where you have two bipartite centers, then they become crescentic, then they become rectangular, then they get partially fused, and they get fully fused. So if I know that I have a crescentic electron apophysis, this girl has at least two years of growth remaining, at the rate of 8 to 10 degrees per year. And if I put a growth modulation over the distal femur, I can get a correction in two years' time. So this is now mathematical. This is now reliable information, which helps us, and not just experiment and say, OK, let's try growth modulation. If it works, it's fine. If it doesn't work, too bad. Come back for an osteotomy when you're skeletally mature. It now helps us to prognosticate and tell to the parents more reliably that with this powerful technique that we have nowadays, can we achieve uh, the correction in a reliable and scientific manner? I think I've exceeded my time, so thank you very much for your attention.